But let's just say that we have risks. Sam talked about risks. We always have risks. It's about pricing the risks, identifying them. And there's a variety of risks. I talked about the deflation. What about recession risks the next two years? We're already ninth year of the expansion. Terrorism, uh, of course, cyber risk. Jim Bannis and I were in New York uh, talking to one of our clients who's chief legal counsel at Verizon, and I think Jim, it was about half our conversation lunch was about cyber risk and what it means for Verizon. There's endless risk, and we could be here talking about this. I know you've been talking about this for some time. Demographics, income inequality, Canadian housing. Can't go into all of them. But the key is to identify the risks. In our business, it's about pricing the risk. But you know, I told you who my favorite economist was, and I told you who our favorite investor was, Warren Buffett. Uh, my favorite physicist was Sir Isaac Newton, because without Newton, there is no Einstein. And Newton's first law is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and every risk also has an opportunity. And so benchmarked against the risks that we talk about all the time and try and price, there is a cornucopia of opportunities to invest. It's the risk of whatever you're doing in business becoming rapidly obsolete because somebody else came up with something. Uh, robot lawyers comes to mind from a personal point of view. I've been trying, you know, over the, I'm a bit of a futurist uh, as a hobby more than anything, but uh, I've been trying over the last few years to think of an industry that can't get disruptive. And I briefly thought of agriculture and then went, wait a minute, we can clone cattle and grow them in vats so we don't need cattle ranches anymore. Sounds like sci-fi, but frankly, we're living in a science fiction novel. Uh, it's not, so it's not just that kind of stuff, it's, it's technological failure. We base so much of our businesses on networks and IT. What if that goes down? It doesn't have to be hacked, it can just fail. You have hackers, of course, and ransomware and uh, denial of service attacks. Uh, one of the most recent uh, famous ones actually was generated from the Internet of Things. A bunch of security cameras were used to bring down websites like Dow Jones. And uh, technological obsolescence, obviously. And from, from the people side of it, it's how do you find the right talent now that can keep up with this stuff that you can trust that won't do something stupid because half of security issues is really training and managing people. I used to be chief information security officer for my last law firm and we focused hugely on training because people do dumb things if they don't know that they're dumb. So you have to kind of fill them in. So we used to send around fake phishing emails and see who we could snag. And it was pretty funny to see how the look on people's faces when we walked down to their office and say, you know what you just did? So finding the right talent that, that has the knowledge to, to cope with a rapidly changing environment that's going to conduct themselves honestly and that's going to be focused on the job and, and be dedicated to it, that's not easy to do. Uh, they may interview well and you may find out that a week or a month into it, you've hired your worst nightmare. So big problem. Yeah, I'd like to share a story of one of our clients. Um, it's a uh, who experienced the same low low oil price environment, but also uh, was hit by the the forest fires. Um, it's a, a public company that has a campus in, campus and catering business and uh, in Fort Murray and um, throughout throughout actually uh, the prairies. And they um, you know right before the uh, downturn, you know they 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 were struggling and. Um, uh, and um, they had to make changes to the business, and fortunately they did that. And uh, I'll, I'll get you know, elaborate on in a while. But um, what happened during the downturn? Again, they had compressed pricing, and and everyone's challenging uh, the, uh, their contracts in place. And um, and then when the forest fires hit, um, you know they, they they did the right thing. They uh, they turned their captain catering uh, lodge, and their, this is their premier lodge, and they actually turned it into an evacuation center. Um, you might know which company it is, but um, the uh, then subsequently, um, you know, the the winds turned, the wind, so, and and unfortunately, the uh, the uh, the their lodge actually took suffered a lot of damage, and so they had to shut down the lodge, and so before it was an evacuation center where they're providing food and shelter to all the uh, displaced residents, and uh, and now they're they're struggling for their lives because this camp was their premier camp. Um, fortunately, before the, uh, this, this all happened, they, uh, they, they implemented an ERM program, Enterprise Risk Management Program, as well as they did a, a business continuity assessment. And a couple things they did is, um, you know, they, they reduced their concentration in the oil and gas industry. That's one thing they did. 
they uh, diversified their, their revenue sources. So in addition to providing caps and catering, they also do modular, uh, you know, modular homes and modular hotels. Um, they, they do um, swamp mats and, and so forth. And so, and so they had a more of a diverse revenue source and they weren't dependent on any location. So even though this was their premier uh, lodge, they were able to survive. The other thing that they did, that they did was that they transferred the risks. Um, not all their sites actually had insurance uh, or comprehensive insurance, um, but this one did. So they were able to, uh, to pull through that. So, and now the, the company will, will, will prosper and, and get through it. So that's all positive. So it's interesting for myself and my husband to be the entrepreneurs who thought they had moved on and have a management staff in place to, to oversee, to realize that we have to get back in the trenches with them because they've never won through this before. They've never had the year where you made, you didn't make money and you lost $250,000 and how do you climb out of that? So it really was getting in and taking action alongside the management team and, and funny enough, you know, a lot of them you had to drag the last six months kicking and screaming because laying people off when you're used to an environment of growth is unheard of. So having to lay off 15% of our head office was one of the actions we knew as owners that we just had to take to survive. And uh, I, think, I think a lot of it has to be, to put, to put it in practical terms, is on the strategic planning. It's how do you communicate, it's all about communication and how do you communicate that out to your team? So you identify, you understand the risk and the strategy around it, but how do you put it into action, into play? So for us, it's about the annual planning, but it's also about quarterly planning and identifying that and having the touch points on a quarterly basis and then taking that down to a monthly and of course, even to a weekly. So we've now over the last eight months set up a structure that we never had in place before to manage the risk tolerance to manage the strategy on a weekly basis. Well, there's huge risk of something coming from outside. I mean, five years ago, I said, I don't think we'll see a self-driving car on in the streets of any city until 2020. Boy, was I wrong, because in 2015, they were driving around Pittsburgh and Singapore. Uh, so by 2020, they're, they're going to be more ubiquitous, I'm sure. Probably the only barrier to their adoption, I'm just using them as an example, is human resistance. And of course, you know, it's kind of like the Borg, resistance is futile, you will be assimilated and you will be driving around on a car without a steering wheel. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen. So those types of disruptors, and that's just one example, but stuff's going to be coming out of left field at an increasing rate. It's really hard to see it coming. I think every firm maybe, and I'm somewhat joking when I say this, should hire a real big science fiction fan because they might have a better idea what's about to happen than anybody. Well, are we talking <laughs> about resiliency though, the ability yeah. of businesses to remain resilient in the face of not only threats that they can foresee, but threats they may not be able to. So having some sort of, having thought through what, what do you do in a true crisis? What sort of plans can you have in place before a crisis happens so that if and when it does happen, and it's usually when, uh, you can respond to it. And that, that includes uh, just the comment that it's usually not just one factor. Well, I've seen three hard drives fail within three minutes of each other. So the idea that three hard drives is good enough is, at least in that situation, wrong. It, it, and the thing I've noticed a lot in, in litigation is when things go wrong, sometimes they just go really wrong. And if one th bad thing happens, you go, it can't get any worse. And yes, it does. Something else happens. It's these cascading events that even if any one of them isn't a black swan, when you put them all together, maybe it's pieces of Lego that make a black Lego swan, I don't know, but uh, you, you find that when things go sideways, they tend to go really badly sideways. And businesses that have actually thought through, what do we do if we have the unthinkable? They, at least they have some kind of plan, so they're, they're already ahead of the game. 